Let us have a word of prayer. Dear God, we give you all the glory for you are worthy to be praised. Every time we come in your presence, Father God, let us not forget you are the creator God, the God of heaven and earth. You are the one, Father God, who promised to be with us, to dwell among us. You are going to promise to provide for us, Father God. You promised to be our healer, our deliverer, and our protector. As we come before you, Father God, we know that we are broken, broken spirited, we are broken emotionally, we are broken spiritually, physically. We need your help, oh God. But the beautiful thing is every time we step into your presence, we know we will never leave the place the same. For in your presence we'll find transformation. In your presence, Father God, there is peace and there is comfort. In your, in your presence, Father, we'll find a safe refuge, a getaway. Hear our prayers, my God. May you visit with us tonight. And may you touch each and every one of us. May we feel your presence. May we feel you. May we feel your presence. May we feel your touch. A different dimension, a different level. That we may go out there and test witness to for you to others who are dying without a Savior, without a God. Father, speak for we are listening. We are ready, oh God. And thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being there for us when we need you the most. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Once again, I, I am very grateful for you for being here tonight. Uh, tonight, I thought it was going to be a bit challenging being here. Uh, so, even news was making, uh, was making some phone calls to make it possible. But you know, God is so good that just when you think it's all over, it's not. So I was sitting there when she told me, well, I won't be able to come with you. So I started to pray. She was making some phone calls, and it wasn't, it wasn't looking good. But in the last minute, she told me, she said, guess what? Somebody came through for me, so I'm able to come with you. I said, praise God. But I never doubt that I was going to be here tonight because I know my God is able. And I know they have Ubers around here. I'm pretty sure they have Ubers, right? Worst case scenario, would have had to call Uber or, uh, or some uh, something. A taxi or something, but some way, somehow, we we uh, I knew I had an appointment with God's people, with God, and he was going to make it happen, and he made it happen. So I am glad to be here with you tonight. And as much as I knew it was a sacrifice for her, for the rest of you, for for me, I knew it was it was a sacrifice for you as well to be here. Uh, what I will try to do next time, I promise. I I, I confess. Sometimes I get so excited. And I kind of speed up, and especially so I have so much, so much materials I want to cover. So I kind of speed up a little bit. And then I, I realized last time I was going home, I said, maybe I'm going too fast. You know, I, I think I should slow down just a tiny bit. Because uh, that way the, the information can sink in. But with the help of technology, I know you can always go back and watch it and slow it down and replay it and replay it. So, oh, that's what he said. I know, I know, I have an accent. It could get difficult sometimes. But thank you to for Pastor Nissan, who's recording every night and uploading all this information and find my people back home watching it, so they're enjoying it. So go back watching it like Sister uh, uh, Diane is doing. Praise God for her. And that's a good way to have a good devotion too, by the way. Praise God for that. So I will try tonight to kind of slow down just a little bit. I thought about that. I said, you know, I need to slow down just a bit so that I, um, I may even try to cover all the stuff I can always go at the end. And then some other time we'll cover. But tonight I'm about to go over a subject for you, uh, a subject with you uh, that is very, very uh, um, dear to me, which is the, well, for all of us, because we call us, we, we are Seventh day Adventists. Uh, you do know what your name stands for, right? We are, we are Adventists and we worship on the seventh day. Now, I'd like to make a tiny correction on, that, on this part, because a lot of people believe that just because we are called Seventh day, day Adventist, meaning that six days during the week, you can be whatever, but then on Sabbath, you are, on Saturday, you're seventh day Adventist, okay? 
So what I want you to be is a seven days Adventist. I'm sure now this, the difference is clear to you, right? So meaning you're going to be an Adventist month, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and, and Sunday again, you start all over. You are, you're always a, you are always a, an Adventist, okay? You're an Adventist who worship on the seventh day. But you are, because the word Adventist means those who are waiting for the second coming of the Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. Meaning you are waiting for the Lord's coming every single day of your life, okay? But you worship on the Sabbath. I just want to make that clear. Sometimes you go places. I see people, they say, oh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And all week long, they do all kind of stuff. They're going through all kind of places and saying all kind of stuff. And then on Sabbath, they're holy. Okay? Now, but the holiness is a lifestyle. And then waiting on Christ on second coming is a lifestyle. Okay? So let's go with me to the Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And I will invite you to go to six, verse uh, uh, 6. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 12 to 17. However, I will give you a brief background of that particular uh, uh, verse. And, and believe it or not, you and I will not stay on verse chapter 6. We are going to chapter 7, but I have to give you this chapter 5, chapter 6 as a background to where we are going. So a quick background is for chapter 6. six. If you look at chapter 5, you you know, um, some of you might have read already or heard or uh, about the, the scrolls in the Revelation, right? Remember the scroll with the seven seals in Revelation. And so in chapter 5, we have, then I saw the right, in chapter 5, verse 1, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Who is worthy? But no one in heaven or on earth, under the earth, could open the scroll, even to look inside of it. Now, believe you and I, John saw that scene, and he was saddened by the scene, because they found no one worthy in heaven, on earth, below the earth, worthy enough to open the scroll, with the seven seals to see what is written inside of it. Now, the problem John was having is because the seven, the scroll with seven seals, the fate of humanity was written inside of it. So then John said, I wept, verse 4, chapter 5. I wept and I wept. You know, like seeing a grown man crying. John said, I wept and I wept because no one was found who is... Um, who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, and he's able to open the scroll in the seven seals. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Because as John was weeping, he was weeping over the fact that there was no one found worthy in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, to open the scroll with the seven seals, then finally one of the elders said, do not weep, John, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has triumphed, Jesus is able to open the scrolls. So fear not, my man. Do not weep because he is going to tell you what is going on. Jesus is able. Jesus is able. Jesus is worthy to open the scrolls. So he told John, stop crying. And then immediately after he was told, stop crying because the lamb is able, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and verse 6, then I saw a lamb, my God, my God. So immediately after they told him, stop crying because the lamb is worthy. And then he said, immediately I saw the lamb approach, and the lamb grabbed the scroll with the seven seals, and the lamb was about to break some seals, my God. So chapter 6 is just the breaking of those seals. If you look at the, 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 the verse 12 of chapter 5, before we skip over, it says, in a loud voice they sing, meaning that uh, around the throne, the, the elders and the four living beings and the angels, in a loud voice they sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. Hallelujah. He was worthy because he was slain. Now, that was the own. The, the starting of this scenario, this situation. Then we saw that Jesus, the lamb, approached, grabbed the scroll with seven seals, and he was ready to open, break some seals, okay? And then we go all the way to verse 12 in chapter 6, okay? 
Now we see that I watch as he, as he, the lamb, as he, Jesus, opened the sixth seal. There were seven seals. He opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like a sackcloth made of good hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as a late fix drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling away, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. My God. Then the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, the princes of the earth, the generals of the earth, the rich of the earth, the mightiest of the earth, and every slave, slave and every free of the earth, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains, and they called out mountains and rocks, fall upon us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come. Who can stand? This is where we got the title for our sermon. This is a great and powerful question. One of the most powerful questions in the book of Revelation. Beside the question, who is worthy? Because he found no one in heaven and on earth worthy to open the, the scroll with seven seals. But now the lamb was worthy to do that. And as the lamb was breaking away the seals and the, the plagues and all the events were taking place. By the way, we're talking about end time events and worship, right? I promise you that we'll be, we'll, we'll be focusing for the, last, for the next three sermons I'm going to be preaching. This one and the next two. We'll be focused on the end times event and, 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 and relation to worship and praise and worship. And so, now we see that John is saying that after the first one is open, something happened. Second one is open. A second seal was broken. Something happened. The third one is broken. Something happened. Fourth one, something. And, 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 and fifth one is broken. And something. And then he said, the sixth one, when the sixth one opened. Now, by the way, the fifth one, when it's open, it was also a powerful scene. But when the sixth one is open, okay, when the sixth one is open, and John saw that the kings and everybody, all the evil, wicked people, they were running away, hiding and screaming and saying, mountains fall on us, all rocks fall upon us and hide us from the face of the one who sit on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, which is the wrath of Jesus Christ. And then he said, for the great day of the wrath has come. Now, who can stand? Okay, who can stand? Now, John, thereafter, this question, who can stand, will take us all the way from chapter 7, even some of the, uh, all, from, all the way to the end of chapter 7, and to, the, to chapter 8, where we're going to have the opening of the seventh seal. Now, watch this now. The, for the simple question at the, end of, at the end of chapter 6, who can stand? Who can stand before God and the Lamb? And so John said, right after this, now we're in chapter 7, and this is where I'm going. Right after this, I saw four angels standing. Now the question was, Brother Kuhn, who can stand? And immediately he said, I saw what? I saw angels standing. Did you see that? Did you catch that, right? Who can stand? Angels standing. In other words, those angels can stand at the four corners of the, of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, prevent anyone from blowing on the land, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice, said, do not harm the land or the sea, the trees, until the, the, we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from the tri all tribes of Israel. Now, John is saying that angels are standing. Who can stand? Now, we have, we have another group that can stand. And this is where we are to answer this question, who can stand? Now, the centrality of worship in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation teaches us more about worship than any other book in the New Testament. In fact, next to some, the, the book of Revelation is next to some as far as when it comes to praise and worship. The heavenly scenes around God's throne portray an ideal of worship that one day believers will enjoy with saints from all times, people, groups, and languages. This perfect heavenly worship suggests the powerful principles of our true worship. It has an important application for what worship ought to be here on earth. Now, the function of the book of Revelation is call the people of God to righteousness, faithful, faithful witness, and worship of the only true God 
and his son Jesus Christ. That's the, the, uh, one of the theme and motive in Revelation. Worship is one of the most significant themes in the book of Revelation. There are 24 occurrences for the, uh, of the most important Greek word for the word worship. There are numerous references given. God, glory, and honor, blessing. Revelation also uses many important worship terms such as to worship, to serve, to praise, to give thanks, to fall down in, in, obey, in, obeisance, of, in obeisance of God, honor. In addition, Revelation depicts a heavenly worship and commands to worship God. Uh, Revelation is full of richly described heavenly sins and we angels, redeemed humans, worship God and Jesus, the victorious Lamb of God. Now we have 16 hymns in the book of Revelation. 16 hymns in the book of Revelation of praise, worship to God, adoration to God. And in most, in most instances of those, of those psalms, there were angelic beings praising God. There were the redeemed ones praising God. The living beings, the, 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 they were praising and worship God, worship God. Sometimes individuals, separate groups were doing it, and sometimes they would be doing it together as one. Many passages in first the vast numbers of people and angels that would worship together before God, and Jesus, the victor, vic, victorious lamb that was slain, is worshipped by a number of myriads and myriads and thousands upon thousands. And then the Bible, the, the Revelation talks about the great multitude saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain. So they're worshiping God. Now, coming to Revelation chapter 6 and 8, there's a concentration entirely on the, uh, th there's a concentration there on end time events. Entirely. Those sections talks all about end times events. And they talk about the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time indescribable job, uh, judge. This is when judgment is going to fall upon a rebellious earth and uh, rebellious nations, rebellious people. Revelations predicting, the giving and symbol, uh, symbolic uh, 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 images of what is going to take place. For instance, we're at the opening of the seven seals, which is where we are. And we have the sound of the seven angelic trumpets. We have the uh, reverberation of the seven thunders and the outpouring of the seven bowls of divine, divine wine. Now, John, in the, in the hand of uh, uh, John saw, in the hand of the one sitting on the throne, the seven, the scroll, with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. The question is asked, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? That was the first question, the first challenge that he saw in the dream. And no one was found, as mentioned in the end of the earth, nowhere else, no one was found. And John, was, John wept bitterly, but one of the elders said, do not weep because the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. He triumphed, and he is worthy, and he's able to open the seven seals. John observed, as he opened one after another, one after another, and unleashed a series of judgmental events upon the earth. So I will talk about worship and the end time event. Now, chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, gives us the opening of this, the fifth seals, suggests a different direction in what was going on. This time, if you look back in chapter 6, chapter uh, 6, 11, um, 11 and 9. Watch this. When, when, verse 9. When, the, when he opened the lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the, because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in the live voice those who were slain, their souls were crying in a loud voice, how long sovereign God, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers were to be killed as they had been completed. Now John is saying that these, this is a different direction. John is taking us in this vision where these people have been slain. This is a different group. They have been slain long before and now their souls are under the altar before the throne of God screaming and uh, shouting with a loud voice, Oh, Lord God, holy and true, avenge our blood. They are crying for justice, just like the blood of, uh, uh, just like the blood of Cain and Abel, uh, sorry, just like the blood of Abel cried unto God for justice. They are crying, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth. 
Now the cry of the people, this is reminiscent to the cry, cry we have heard many times before in, in, in the Old Testament. We heard about the blood of Abel, cried unto God. And we also heard about during the time of Noah, when the people were crying because the people were so wicked, the wickedness of human beings were so high before God. The Lord said, my spirit shall not abide with men forever, for he is indeed flesh. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he has grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth, both, both men and beasts and creeping things and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. Because why? They were so wicked, God had to destroy them. But why? Because people, the, 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 the blood of the innocent were crying unto God, and God had to do something. The same thing in Revelation. We've seen that because the blood of those people, the souls of those people under the altar were murdered, martyred by, uh, by the wicked ones. I cried unto God, say, how long before you, before you give us our justice? Before you give us, uh, uh, you avenge our blood? Uh, and in, in Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, we heard that, we saw that when Moses appeared, when God appeared to Moses, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. So I'm telling you, when you cry unto God, he hears. When you're going through pain and suffering, he sees. And God can feel your pain. He knows your pain. He knows what you're going through. When you think that he doesn't understand, he does understand you. And God said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned, my God, I am concerned about their suffering, meaning God concerns about you and me. The God of the universe cares about you and me. And now the cry of the Israelite has reached me. Their cry reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptian and to bring them up to that land of good, spacious, uh, gracious, spacious land, in a, a land flowing milk and honey. God knows. God knows. God knows everything. Your pains, your struggles, God knows. He sees everything. Your oppression, your depressions, your confusions, God sees. He hears everything. Your cries, your screams, your prayers. Your praises, even when you're crying in the middle of the night, alone in a room when no one else is listening to you, God is God. God God hears. God hears. God is listening to you because He's always there with you. And Jesus made this promise in Matthew before He said, "Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of time." I think I mentioned that to you before. Sometimes you feel like, oh, just because I'm a Christian, everything should be rosy for me. That's not true at all. The promise is that I will go with you through the fire. It doesn't mean you're not going to go through fire. You will be going through fire, but God is saying that. But as you go through the fire, I will be with you. As you go through the troubles, I will be with you. So God sees everything. God knows everything. God hears everything. God feels everything. Your heartbroken, your emotional endurances, in his time now, in his time, he said, let me go down and deliver my people. So in his time, God will come down and God will rescue his faithful ones, his faithful children, because he knows, he sees, he hears, and he feels. So the opening of the fifth seals gives us a glimpse at why judgment, okay? As you're reading, you heard, we read about the opening of the seals. Judgment were falling upon the people. So the opening, of, the opening of the fifth seal gives us a glimpse at why the judgment of God is indispensable and why the judgment of God is so valuable. Because they were wicked. Because if God didn't judge these people, some other group of people would be very disappointed. Those who were murdered innocently, their blood would be crying unto God day and night saying, God, where is our justice? Because you declare that I am the God of justice. Behold, vengeance is mine. So they would be crying unto God, where is our justice? So the opening of the six seals give us a glimpse at why judgment is important. Why God must punish the wicked. God must avenge the blood of the innocent. The sin links God's judgment with the wickedness of humanity. Now this, the, these souls under the altar are crying very loud, Sovereign Lord, 
holy and true God, avenge our blood. At this point, the knowledge, they are, at this point, to acknowledge their plea, then each of them was given a white robe. God is saying to them, hey, I heard you, and I've seen what you've gone through. And God gave them a right robe. They were told, wait, for the servants and brothers will be murdered. So in verse 11, we're learning that more and more brothers and sisters will, uh, will be murdered later. So they have to wait for those to come all together. Why under the altar their souls were? It's because Jesus, they were not being sacrificed. They were not offered a sacrifice, but they were murdered because of their faith and testimony of Jesus. Because they, they, because they maintained the word of God and faith in Jesus. They were murdered because of that. And so they were placed under the altar. Jesus was the one who, were placed, who was placed on the altar. So Jesus was the pastoral lamb. It is at this point this group received the white robes. The white robes assigned each of these murdered spirits as pledge of future and final glory can uh, console and prove that no judgment awaited them. And so the God is, by giving them the white, robe, white, white robes, they were told that, hey, wait here to say that you will not face God's judgment, but only the wicked will face God's judgment. Okay? Now, as, we, re as we, we just read verse chapter 12, okay, chapter 12, I mean 6, 12, and 17. I watched as they opened the sixth seal, right? And there was a great earthquake and the multitude. So we heard about the question, who can stand? Now, here's the, the, why this question is important, because just before that question, the verse is saying that the kings and queens of the earth cannot stand. The princes and the princesses of the earth cannot stand. The great generals of the earth cannot stand. The rich man and the rich woman cannot stand. The mighty man and mighty woman cannot stand. Every slave cannot stand. Every free cannot stand. Because this was time of God's judgment. It was time for judgment. Time for them to pay for the crimes they have committed against God's children and against the humanity. They are all calling mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of God and the Lamb. Why? For the great wrath of the great wrath of God has come, and who can stand? Who can stand is the remainder of this series, the chapter, chapter 6, chapter 7 and 8, is the question John is answering. After they asked the question, John saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back four destructive winds. But then another angel with the seal of the living God called, on, called out the very loud word, do not harm the land, they see the trees until God's servants are sealed. The first group is sealed. It's 144,000 from the tri all tribes of Israel. So we learned that the angels can stand before the throne of grace. The 144,000 can stand because they have been sealed by the seal of the living God. Now, who can stand is not the, besides the angels, 144,000? John is still explaining. And who can stand? There is another group who can stand. And John saw that a great multitude. Now, let's look verse chapter nine, chapter 7, verse 9. After this, after this, after means that I saw the angels standing, who can stand? Angels standing, who can stand? The 144,000 sealed by the seal of the living God are standing. And now John is saying, after this, after I saw this group standing, verse 9, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people, and, and, and standing before the throne in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Amen. And so just like the souls that were crying, saying, God, how long before you give us our justice? They were given white robes to wear. Just like the 144,000 were sealed by the seal of the living God. And today we're standing. Now this multitude group, they, uh, this, it, it's a multi-ethnic uh, ethnic group, I call it. They, it, it. It's impossible to count them. They're from every nation. They're from every tribe. They're from every people. They're from every language. So what that means for me, who is Haitian, I feel good about that when I read that. I say, my God, the Haitians are going to be there too. And I look at it and say, my God, Jamaicans are going to be there. Our people from Kenya are going to be there. Japanese are going to be there. Chinese are going to be there. Koreans are going to be there. Indians are going to be there. People from, uh, from uh, uh, Ghana is going to be there. Sudan is going to be there. We all going to be there standing before the throne of grace wearing white robes to praise God. There is room for all of us. 
There is room for all of us. And there is a road for each and every one of you here tonight. There is certainly a road for me and I believe it. And I want to put, to put this robe on me so I can stand before the throne of grace. Standing before the throne in front of the Lamb, they all wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands. And they are crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Now watch this now. What a contrast. Before they were crying, what? How long, oh Lord, before you judge, you give us our justice, right? How long before you avenge our blood? Now that God has avenged their blood, they are standing firm before the throne, wearing their white robes, meaning that they have been justified. And then they cry, salvation belongs to our God. The word salvation is simply mean God save. Salvation belong to our God. God is the one who saves them. And so this, as they stand, watch this, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12. I want to take you there real quick. Verse 11 and 12. Watch this now. As they were singing this song, meaning the righteous one, okay, we're talking about the the souls under the altar. Now they're all standing. We're talking about the 144,000 standing. And we're talking about the great multitude with every nation, every tongue, every tribe, etc. They're all standing. And they're singing, salvations belong to our God. Salvations belong to our God. They are so excited because they, Jesus saved them. And then, Bible says in verse 11, all the angels. How many angels we say? All the angels. That were standing around. Now remember the question, who can stand? That's the question we answer. Angels are standing. The 444,000 standing. The souls of those martyred are standing. And the multitude is standing. Now the angels who are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne of the before the throne and worship God. My God, did you see what just happened? I think you just missed it. So let me explain it to you. This contagious moment of praise and worship of the great multitude instigates the adoration, adorative response from all the angels, all the angels around the throne. Now the angels are not standing. Remember, the souls were under the altar, not standing. But once they start to sing the salvation song, the angels, the four living beings, the four elders and the living beings, they got on their faces to praise God. And now what changed? Something has changed. Something changes right away. They started their praise and adoration with amen. And this is what it means. Mean, yes, it is true. Yes, we agree with you. Amen. It is true what you're saying. But the celestial beings add another dimension to this praise and worship moment. You see, the, the, right, the, the one who was saved are singing about God's salvation. But the angelic beings will ha uh, have been with God for so, many, for so long. They know more about God. Than those who are saved. So they're adding in that different dimension to the praise and worship chorus. They say, Praise and glory be to our God. Now the other one says, Salvation belongs to our God. But the angels are adding, Praise and glory belong to our God. Wisdom and honor belong to our God. Thanks and gratitude belong to our God. Power and strength belong to our God. Forever and ever and ever. Amen. And they all shout, Hallelujah. Glory be to God. They added a different dimension to the praise and worship moment. It is as if you're standing here to sing every praise to our God and somebody else just have a different tune that they are singing that is different than what you're singing. And you reach the point where you cannot keep singing. You just have to stop and to listen to what they're singing because they are so excited. And what they're singing is so beautiful. What they're singing is so powerful. What they're singing is so contagious. You have to stop what you're doing and listen and join them in this chorus. So the angels add a different dimension to it. The word praise is eulogy, and I, yeah, the word the word the word praise is uh, eulogia in, in, in the Greek, which means is where you get your word, English word eulogy, meaning speaking well of someone. Well, what we do sometimes we don't like praising people while they're alive. Okay, we wait until they're dead. Right? You know, you know, you know, you know. You have relatives, but maybe you have done it a time or two. You wait until they die, and then you buy flowers, you send it, you go put the flowers, say the final goodbye. That's when you start crying, say how good they were, how nice they were, how, 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 you know, what, what, what such a great person that the world's going to miss them. But while they were alive, you never do that for them, okay? But what is going on in the throne of God, before the throne, is that they were praising God, eulogy. They were giving praise, which means that to highly give tribute to someone, all right? 
So worship is to speak well of God. They were speaking well of God. They say, oh, glory, wisdom, doxa, and Sophia. Sophia is the word for, 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 for wisdom in Greek, and doxa is for glory, also a tribute of God, which means those are all attributes of God, which means that God is so impressive. God is so great. Thanksgiving, they're giving thanksgiving for God for all that he has done for them. And then the folk, the angels, everyone has say, amen. That is true. And then to verse 13, 14, John is now become, John now becomes a participant. Watch this now. John becomes a participant in the narrative. Now it's no longer seen the vision happening. John is now being transported and being part of the vision. Verse 13, let's read. Then one of the elders asked me, as if John is now standing in the scene, and on the scene, and one of the elders asked me, these white robes, who, these wearing the white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? Now remember, we come from a question. What was the first question was, who is worthy? We found that Jesus, the lamb, was worthy. Amen? The second question was, who can stand? We learned that there are three group of people who can stand. But now John is asking this question. Uh, John is being asked this question of the elder. John, who are these people? And where did they come from? And John did not know the answer, right? John knows, John did not know the answer, but he trusts that the elder knows the answer. So John says, sir, my Lord, you know, I do not know. You know, but I do not know. Who are they, John? And where did they come from? That's, that's a question. That's a twofold question. Who are they and where did they come from? So let us first consider the first question, part of the question. Who are they? John already introduced them in the chapters as those murdered for the word of God in the testimony of Jesus. Now, this is very important. Get this. Who are they? They have been murdered for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. And the faithful servants of the living God who will be in those faithful servants of the living God will be murdered for the commandments and faith of Jesus, according to Revelation 6, 9, and 11. Why did they lose their lives? They were murdered because they maintained the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, all right? Team, this theme is, is, is reiterated in Revelation 14, 12, where I say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So those people, that's who they are, okay? Their obedience to the word of God or commandments of God in the testimony of Jesus or the faith of Jesus led to the sacrificial death, the word of God or commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus or the faith of Jesus led to the sacrificial death. And now John saw this great, they, they are part of this great multitude. That's who they, who they are. Okay? That's who they are. Now, the first one is the group under the altar, which I explained to you already. That's part of this multitude. The second group is, subgroup is the 144,000. I covered that with you already. They were part of that multitude. And the third group is the great multi-ethnic multi, multi uh, multitude, which I've explained to you already, from every tribe, every tongue, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they were that part, okay? So now, these people, they were wearing white robes because they are justified. And because they were crying for justice, they are justified. And now they say, we just learned that they were singing the song of praise. They were wearing their white robes, meaning that righteousness was imputed unto them. They become, they are holy now. They, they were sanctified. They, they were sanctified. They were justified. And they are being glorified before the throne of grace. Wearing, uh, holding the palm branches means that they are enjoying a season of peace, season of joy, and season of victory in their hands. And that's what that's symbolizing. And they are enjoying the eternal shalom of God. They're living in God's presence. Now, the next, so who are they? We already explained it. Faithful servant of the living God. They are faithful servant of the living God. They abide in the word of God. They maintain the faith of Jesus. They, were, they observe the commandments of God. They proclaim the testimony of Jesus. And they are murdered because of their faith. That's who they are. The second question, where did they come from? Now, the Bible says they, they come out of a great tribulation, the great distress. Jesus said, if those they had not been cut short, no one would have survived. But, they, but the, for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened, Matthew 24. They were bruised, they were blooded, but they have been made white through washing in the blood of the Lamb. And the psalmist, as of under divine inspiration, declares, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising in setting of the sun, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. 
our God comes. He is no longer silenced. God calls to the heavens above and to the earth below that he may judge his people. Gather me, my faithful servants, who made the covenant with me by their sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteous, for God himself is now judge. Psalm 50, verse 1 through 6. So this is a recollection of God saying, gathering, the gathering is gathering of God's faithful servants who are now present before God, who have made a covenant with God by their sacrifice, meaning they give up their lives for the righteousness, for the cause of God. Where did they come from? Where did they come from? They come from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language, every social class. And they have been humiliated. They have been persecuted. They have been tortured. They have been killed for the word of God and the testimony of, of Jesus. That's where they come from. So they're like a group of soldiers coming, returning from the war. They have been through the great tribulations. And the white wolves, palm branches signify that the war is over. And now there is eternal peace. So the souls on the altar and the rest of them join together to sing that song to the, to the Lamb, to sing the song of salvation. Now, here, we're about to come to a close. Who can stand before God? And the Lamb was the question that was asked in chapter 6, 17. Who can stand? Who can stand? God's faithful servant who had made a covenant with them by sacrifice, they can stand. Now, this way for serving to come out of great tribulation, meaning they went through a lot. They went through a lot to make it, but they endure until the end. They are able to stand before the throne of grace. Now, why are they standing before the throne? This is the part I love. They're standing to serve and worship God day and night. Yes, yeah, somebody ought to say amen. They, they're standing to worship and praise God day and night. Why? Because they have been redeemed. They're singing the song, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They have been redeemed, so they're there to praise God. Why are they praising God? They're praising God because they were saved by him. They say, salvation belongs to our God. Now, as they're singing and be standing in the throne, watch where the promise, one of the promises I love in the Bible, verse 17, uh, 16 and 17. I'm just going to read it for you real quick. Uh, in fact, let's stop with... Um, Let's start with verse uh, 14. And I answer, sir, I don't know. And he say, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And who sit on the throne will spread his stint over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. Nor any scourge, uh, 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 scourging heat for the Lamb. Lamb at the center of the throne will be the shepherd, and he will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. My God. And now this is it. This section we just read, chapter 7, 16, 17. Here we have the promise of eternal protection, and we have, eter we have the eternal provisions, and we have eternal presence. Watch this now. He said, in God, okay, and he said, in God, God will, God will do what? What did he say? The first one, he said, God will do what? God will spread his tent over them, and the sun will not beat upon them. So that's God's, that's the, that, that's a promise of eternal protection by being in the throne of God. And then the next one said, never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The, 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 lamb, uh, the lamb is the shepherd, leading them to springs of water. That's that's a promise of eternal protection, okay? God will protect them. I mean, not, not, not just protection, my bad. That's eternal provisions. God is going to provide for them, okay? And God will wipe away, the last part, and God will wipe away every tear, not all tears, but just every single drop of tear from their eyes. That's the promise of eternal presence of God. And what takes away our suffering? What takes away our needs? What takes away, what takes away is our fear is the presence of God. And say so God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that's the promise of eternal presence of God. The difficulties that the saints encounter and experience during their lives on earth, will, they will never experience again. And you ought to say amen for this. Because that's the blessed hope. 
It means that we will put this all this pain and suffering and troubles and fear and worries behind us as we stand before the throne of grace, giving praise and glory. Glory. We will enjoy the eternal protection. We will enjoy the eternal provisions. We will enjoy the eternal presence of God in our midst. And I love this last part where I say, never again will they experience hunger. Never again will they experience thirst. Never again will they experience, uh, will they experience heat of the sun. Never again will they experience tears in their eyes. Never again will they experience mourning. Never again will they experience crying. Never again will they experience pains and suffering. Never again will they experience death. Because they will be standing in the presence of the living God. The source of life. The source of hope. The source of comfort. Never again will they experience the pains and agony of this world. Never again. And so later on, we can get a glimpse of what Paul was talking about. Because Paul says that will come a day when we'll be standing and we will look at death in the eyes and sing this song. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because death will be no more. Never again will we experience that. Never again will experience cancer. Never again will experience those incurable diseases like lupus. Never again will we experience AIDS. Never again will we experience that. Never again. Never again. Never again. Mothers will not have to bury their children. Children will not have to bear the pain of burying their parents. Never again. Never again will you experience discrimination. Never again. Never again will you be worrying about seeing tomorrow. Never again. Because you will be in the presence of the living God. But I love this part when Paul says, we're going to stand and say, death, why is your victory? For so long we fear death. For so long we fear death. That's the reason why I'm, when I'm, in, uh, 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 I'm in, uh, on an airplane, every time there's a turbulence, my heart is falling out of my chest. Because I'm afraid this could be the last day I see my family. All right? So why is death? So we can have the strength to say, death, why is your victory? Death, why is your sting? I'm not afraid of you anymore because you have no power in this domain. And then he busted out, say, thanks be to God, my God. He said, after he said, oh, death, why is your sting? He said, thanks be to God. He gives us victory, victory through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thanks be to God, for you give us victory through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. You know, for me, it's not so much death. You know, yeah, I don't like death at all. In fact, in the church where I met sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times, I have to do funerals. I enjoy the weddings. I enjoy the baptism. I enjoy the baby dedications. But when it comes to the funerals, I hate it. Because it's, it's so painful. I don't like it. And another part I hate about this life is the part about getting old. You know, I remember when I was very young and, and, and handsome and good looking. Don't look at me now, but I used to look really good. So I used to look in the mirror, my hair really dark and, and everything. Look, my skin so innocent and the tone is very good stuff, okay? But now I look in the mirror, I see I'm gray. I'm getting gray and I realize I know what's coming. I'm getting old and I say, God, I cannot deal with this. I like to say forever young. But I know that's impossible. I cannot stay forever young now. That is why the promise of eternal life sounds so good to me. I do not want to let it go. I cannot wait for the day, not just for me to stare at death and say, where is your victory? But for me to look at old age and say, old age, where is your victory? Look at me now. Look at me now. I'm who's laughing now. It's me who's laughing because you have no power over me. I can wake up whenever I want to praise God. I can stop whenever I want to, and there will be no thirst, no hunger, and no knees giving me a problem, no arthritis, whatever they call it, because I am in the presence of the living God. And I wait to stare at old age and say, you have no power. You have no dominion over me. You see, his reading people will be glorified, to dwell with them in the new heavens and the new earth. Our Satan and his fallen angels. All people who do not believe in Jesus Christ will face a just, just, just eternal punishment. You see, the essence of worship is acknowledging the lordship of the one true God. God's plan to make all things right in creation means that Christ 
is we bring people who will be worshipped worship and serve God for all eternity. For those people who never experienced how to praise and worship God one day, I hope you have that experience this, 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 this hour first. That where you, you just, just imagine about what God is going to do for you. Just the thought of where you're going to be, where you're going, should get you excited. And sometimes I talk to people. I, I, I got a guy, I was talking to him one day, and he said, well, I'm going to die anyway. I don't care. Let me just enjoy life now. But I tell him, I say, listen, man, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? You can either hold on to the promises of God. You say you're going to die anyway, which is true. So I say, what have you got to lose? Because you cannot stop death from coming at you. Now, but except, now, now, you cannot stop it, but you have a promise that even though you will die now, that you have a promise of eternal life coming your way. So what have you got to lose? It, to me, it's a win-win situation, okay? I'm going to go anyway, so it's best that let me just, what do you call it? Take a leap of faith, all right? So if I, if, 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 if uh, uh, on the morning of the resurrection, I'm standing there, glory to God. But I'm not going to pass that on because it costs me nothing. It's free and it's available to all. You see, the heart of worship is the entire life of orientation towards God. Not simply liturgical actions, words, or praise. Actions, words, worship are outward expression of person's deep heart orientation. Worship involves honoring, serving, respecting God for who he is and for what he has done. And so tonight, tonight, my appeal is simple. I have three, three appeals I want to make. Number one, number one, if I know, I know I can look, I see, and I don't know you all to say that, but let me say this. The first appeal is if you have not made peace with Jesus and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that first appeal is for you. To say tonight, Lord, you know, I want to be there. I want to be there to experience this eternity of praise and singing and with the chorus wearing the white robes. I want to stand before the, before the, before the Lamb and God and to praise and sing his glory. And then the next, the next appeal for you is this. Perhaps you have one day, you know, have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But then you go astray. You went astray. And then you say, well, Lord, I want to give my life over to you again. I want to recommit my life into your care. I want to recommit my life to you. If that's you, that's the second appeal. I want you to stand up and say, Lord, I want to recommit and come forward and we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. Now, the, now, the next appeal is tonight, you heard this word, that the blessed hope that one day we all will be standing before the throne of grace where we'll be praising God for, for all eternity. And then we know that there will be no more needs and wants. And we'll have victory over death forever and ever. And if you're willing to accept this one and recommit to that, I want you to stand up as well as we're about to pray. Now, let me, tell, let me share this with you, this last verse. This last verse. Then I saw... A new heaven, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. For the former things are passed away. And God will declare from the throne, behold, behold, I made everything. Behold, I made everything new. You see, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. He said, behold, all things, the whole things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. My call tonight is this. You willing to make peace with God? You willing to invite Jesus into your life to say, Jesus, now is the time. I'm, re- I'm ready to give my life to you. I'm ready to, to be a candidate among those who are going to wear the white robes to stand before the Lamb. The question is, who can stand? Are you ready to stand, to meet your maker, to say, God, I am among one of those who have gone through great tribulations. I have suffered. I have been tortured. I have been persecuted for the righteousness sake. But I am ready to stand. And I'm ready to wear this robe. And I'm ready to sing with the great choir 
Salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God. Among the group was going to make the even the angels and the four living beings and the elders to drop down on their knees to say, "My God, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised." You are worthy to receive power, glory, honor, and wisdom because you are God and you are God alone. Is that the plea of your heart? Please stand up. And as you're saying, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Tonight is the night that if I don't see you again, I'm going to leave with the conviction that you have received the word of God tonight. That you're willing to commit your life into God's care. That we know this world will pass. This world and everything in it shall pass. The only thing that we have for sure we can hold on to is this hope, this blessed hope of this eternal life that is freely offered unto us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight is that the plea of your heart. Say, Savior, Savior, do not pass me by. Please hear my humble cry. Please hear my deep For your salvation, for your righteousness, for your justice, for your sanctification, for your justification, for your glorification. Hear my humble cry. Is there someone who would like for us to pray for a specific thing tonight? I feel like my spirit that there's someone who's struggling with this decision and say, Lord, I want to come for it, I want to come, I want to come, I want to come, I want to come, but let me tell you something. If you hear the Spirit of God speaking to you, do not harm your heart. Allow the Spirit of God to move upon your soul, your heart, your mind, and allow the Spirit to touch you. Allow the Spirit of God to trust on you this morning. Allow the Spirit of God to have peace for you. Don't lose this. Just allow the Spirit to have peace. You want to go to close your eyes. Close your eyes at this time. Just close your eyes. I want my brothers to pray. I want to pray. But I'm 
Question is asked Who can stand before the Lamb and before God? Because the hour of your wrath has come. Who can stand? Now we learn of three different groups of individuals, Father God. We learn about those who are murdered for the righteousness' sake, those who maintain the word of God, those who maintain faith and the testimony, commandments of God. They've been murdered because of their faith. Been murdered because of their perseverance. And their souls are crying, Lord, how long, how long will your vengeance? They were given the right robes. They were given the right robes, able to stand before the power of grace. They will find another group, this special group, the 144,000, you say, from all the tribes of Israel. They were sealed by the seal of the living God, which means that I know, we know now that no one can stand before God. No one can sin unless they have been sealed by the seal of the living God. And tonight the appeal is for God. We want to be sealed by your seal, O oh God. We want to be sealed by the seal of the living God. We want to belong to you and to you alone, Father God. We do not to wa- want to worship any other gods. We do not want to worship spirits. We do not want to worship your crea- cre- creatures, Father God. We want to, cre- to worship the creator God. We want to belong to you. So we declare, Father God, put your seal on us tonight. Put your seal on us, oh God. Put your seal on us so that we can stand before you. And when the great question is asked, who can stand? We can say, behold, here we are, Father God, standing before the throne of grace, singing the song of the the Redeemer, saying salvation belongs to our God. Only you can save us tonight. Somebody struggling with this decision to say, God, take me just as I am. God, receive me just as I am. God, save me. There's somebody struggling with this one. Hear the humble cry. Hear the cry of the heart. Say, Jesus, save me. Save your Savior. Do not pass me by. Do not pass me by. Do not pass this individual by tonight, Father God. Save this individual. Lord my God, I want to be there to stand to sing this new song. I want to be there to express an eternity of praise, of joy, of peace. The war is over. I want to be able to stand up and stare death in the face and say, Oh, death, why is your victory? Oh, death, why is your sting? You have no power over me because I am now in the presence of the living God, the source of life. Death has no place there. I want to be able to look at old age and say, old age, I have won. You lost. Praise be to my God. I want to look at the world and all its sufferings, all its pains and its agonies and everything in it and say, ah, you have lost. We won because of the blood of the lamb. We can stand. We can stand. We can stand before the wrath of God. We can stand before the throne of judgment. We can stand because we have been washed by the blood of the lamb. So God, here is my plea. Everyone here tonight, they are here because they believe. They are, they are here because they have this blessed hope that one day you will come and take us with you. We are Adventists. We are waiting on the second coming. Here is my plea, Father God. Let each and every one here made it on that day, Father God. Let them all stand before you, Father God, to sing this new song. The husbands, the wives, the children, and all who who are close, close relative loved ones, Father God. Give them this gift of salvation. Bring them all together with the great multitude for them to sing this new song of Moses. Father, hear our prayers. We know we're not righteous. We know we are sinners, but we have been saved by grace. 
And because of you, we know we have a high priest before God. We can stand boldly before the throne. And whatsoever we ask in the name of Jesus, we know it shall be done unto us. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, save us, Father God. And as we're about to leave this place, may you spread your protection over us, Father God. May you grant us your everlasting peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow night, I invite you to come. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at a call to worship in the book of Revelation. A call to worship. You do not want to miss that sermon tomorrow. A call to worship. In fact, if you can invite a friend, bring them alone with you. It's going to be great. A call to worship. Call to worship the living God.